guess I'll go ahead and get started. Um, so today I'm talking about ocular surface disorders. And these are the topics I'll be covering. So it's off of BCSC, although I'll be spending a lot more time on blepharitis and dry eye than the rest. So starting with blepharitis, basically two main types, anterior and posterior. So anterior is going to be lash line, so you have collarettes around the eyelashes. Um, another name for anterior blepharitis is seborrheic blepharitis. And then posterior is going to be posterior to the lashes, which is meibomian glands. And so you have meibomian gland plugging or inspissation, and um, rosacea is a common cause of posterior blepharitis. Um, anterior blepharitis, you often see it in combination with posterior blepharitis. Um, symptoms, eyelid redness, burning, and foreign body sensation. Treatment's going to be eyelid hygiene, warm compresses, and lid scrubs. Um, if there's an inflammatory component, you could consider a brief course of topical steroids. Um, and then a topical antibiotic, um, such as erythromycin or bacitracin, would be warranted as well. Um, with posterior blepharitis, um, more commonly known as meibomian gland dysfunction, um, what happens is that the meibomian glands are responsible for producing the lipid layer in the tears. And so when you have plugging of the bimobian glands, then the tears are going to be evaporating faster than normal. Um, rosacea is a risk factor to this. And actually, if you have severe blepharitis, it can lead to um, corneal inflammation or even an ulcerative keratitis. And so meibomian gland dysfunction results in um, tear film instability, like, to, like I talked about. So you can measure that increased evaporation by looking at the tear breakup time. And you do that by um, putting a drop of fluorescein in the eye and turning on the cobalt blue light on the slit lamp. And then after, they, after the patient blinks, you start counting. And once you start seeing like a black um, kind of space appear in the tear film, that's when you stop counting. And if that number is less than 10 seconds, that's going to be increased, um, or that's going to be decreased tear breakup time or increased evaporation. Um, symptoms, burning sensation, foreign body sensation, redness of the eyelids, also recurrent chalasia. Um, and the signs will be meibomian gland plugging, as you can see in this picture. Um, you also may see some telangiectasias at the eyelid margin. Um, and with chronic um, blepharitis, you can see um, actually metaplasia of the, of the meibomian gland orifices with keratin. Um, this is kind of a new way to measure um, how the quality of the meibomian glands, and it's a um, scan called LipaView, and it's an interferometer that actually measures the thickness of the lipid component of the tears, and it can assess the quality and the quantity of the lipids being released from the meibomian glands. And you can get a, um, so LipaView 2, I guess, is their updated uh, version, and you can actually see, it's really cool to see all the lipids kind of in the meibomian glands. I can't get my mouse back, but on the left, um, you've got uh, normal um, meibomian glands, and you can see all those oils there. On the right, you can see meibomian gland dropout, and you can see that there's not as many um, lipids in the uh, meibomian glands in the lids there. So traditional management, you all may know, um, include warm compresses. Lid scrubs, I don't really um, emphasize in people with a big posterior or a meibomian gland dysfunction component. I think it's more helpful for if you've got like scruff and collarettes around the lashes, but I don't really recommend lid scrubs for those with just truly posterior blepharitis, um, just because the lid scrubs, I don't think it really gets back there to like unclog meibomian glands. So warm compresses is a big thing because warmth can um, unclog those oil glands. Um, you can still consider topical antibiotic ointment at bedtime. Um, you can also consider low-dose um, tetracycline class antibiotics, such as doxycycline or minocycline in low doses. Um, I typically do 50 um, BID for blepharitis. Um, if you've got someone who's really sensitive to medication or really skinny and small, you can go with a lower dose, like even just 20 milligrams a day. Um, it works better on an empty stomach. Um, and I do tell everyone that I, when I start um, doxy or minocycline that um, women are more prone to get yeast infections. There can be skin um, photosensitivity and GI upset. Um, it is contraindicated in children under 10 and pregnant women. Um, if you have a child with blepharitis, you could consider erythromycin orally. Um, and there are several new treatments that are out there for blepharitis with varying amounts of success. Um, tea tree oil is a, um, it's an entity that's used for eradication of the demodex mite, which is seen up there, which is believed to be a common cause of blepharitis. And with demodex, you'll actually see some cylindrical dandruff at the base of the lashes. So it's a little bit different than um, what I'd shown previously with anterior blepharitis. So you see like a little kind of clearish 
cylinder at the base, and if you see that, um, it's thought to be um, due to the demodex mite. Um, if blepharitis is um, due to demodex, it's often refractory to conventional blepharitis treatments, and um, this can be treated with in-office 50% tea tree oil and daily lit hygiene with tea tree oil shampoo or wipes. The problem with tea tree oil, I think it works, but it really stings a lot, so you need to have someone who is willing to kind of go through the burning that you feel with tea tree oil. Um, so I don't actually recommend it um, unless someone really wants to try it. Um, it does eradicate after four weeks, and usually there's no um, repeat treatment needed for a whole year. Um, there is a newer product, which I think may be hopefully better than tea tree oil, called Avanova, um, which just got, I think, released a couple years ago. So Avanova is a product that contains Neutrox, which is hypochlorous acid 0.01%. So it's a very, very dilute acid available by prescription. It's a non-stinging spray. Um, and you use it BID, and it actually kills Demodex and 99.999% of other microorganisms, and it gets rid of debris and inflammatory markers. So this may be a better option than um, tea tree oil because it doesn't sting. Um, the next is an in-office treatment called Blefex. Um, so Blefex is basically like, if you imagine, it's kind of like like a like a electric toothbrush. At the very end of the tip here, you got a soft cotton brush and it spins. And so you dip this into um, some sort of mild soap like a baby shampoo mixture or you can deep dip it even into tea tree oil and you numb the eyes and you basically run it along the lashes and the meibomian glands in the office and then you rinse. And that basically works like a really, really good um, lid scrub. So this is done in office. Um, patients still need to perform at-home lid hygiene, um, but their lid hygiene may be more effective after Blefex because this is like a deep cleaning and then they still need to maintain their routine at home. Um, this may need to be repeated um, about every three to six months. Um, Lipiflow is another in office treatment. So this is a 12 minute thermal lid massage to open up um, blocked meibomian glands. Uh, topical anesthetic is needed and the way it works is that um, there's actually a heat component that kind of rests on the inner part of um, the uh, tarsal conjunctiva and so it uses heat and massage to kind of open up the meibomian glands. Um, the effects of one treatment can last about 12 months. The problem is that it doesn't work in everybody. 20% um, of patients may not see an improvement in their symptoms and um, I'm told that you need to really have good patient selection because um, it's not for everybody. Patients do need to have some open meibomian glands for it to work, so if they're all clogged, it really doesn't work. Um, and they also need to have um, complete blinks. So if they don't have good blinking, then the lipoflow flow is not as effective. It's really expensive. It's like $800 to $1,000 for, oh, I don't know if that's one treatment or multiple treatments, but it's not for everybody because of the expense. Um, Thermoflow is another um, modality, not much literature is out there, but this is also another in-office treatment of the lids with pressure and heat, but the difference here is that there's no inner component of heat, and the pressure is actually applied by the practitioner, so it's not like an automatic thing that you just like set and forget, you have to be there. Um, it's still 12 minutes, you don't need a topical anesthetic because it's just external, um, and I'm not sure how much this one costs, but um, it's three to four treatments are needed about two weeks apart. Um, intense pulse light, or IPL, is another in-office treatment. Um, this uses a laser light to heat the lower uh, meibomian glands, um, and that closes down the telangiectetic blood vessels, and you can only do it on the lower eyelids. Um, it uses a different wavelength than IPL for facial acne. You need about three to four sessions um, within a four-month period. The effects are supposed to last about a year, um, but this is another um, really expensive treatment. Um, then there's meibomian gland probing, which I think was kind of maybe in favor a few years ago and I thought it died off, but then I just recently saw a study which was looking at this, um, so maybe people are still doing this. But this is an in-office treatment that um, you use a small steel probe to open up um, the meibomian glands and it's thought to work by like kind of opening up fibrotic membranes covering the meibomian glands and you do this right at the slit lamp. And it's available in different lengths and under you do it under topical anesthesia. Um, the effects of the treatment can last at least six months, but there is a concern that by like physically, mechanically shoving something in the meibomian glands that could cause more trauma and cause more inflammation. Um, so this is not something that I typically do. 
Okay, so next we're going to talk about um, dry eye. So the tradition, traditional definition of dry eye was that dry eye is a disorder of the tear film due to tear deficiency or excessive evaporation, which causes damage to the interpalpebral uh, ocular surface and is associated with ocular discomfort. Um, it sounds very reasonable. Um, however, um, in the past several years, we've noted that dry eye is a lot more complicated than just tear deficiency and, and excessive evaporation. So there's a newer dry eye definition that came out, which says that, that dry eye is a multifactorial disease of the tears and ocular surface that results in symptoms of discomfort, visual disturbance, and tear film instability with potential damage to the ocular surface. It is accompanied by increased osmolarity of the tear film and inflammation of the ocular surface. So I've highlighted and underlined inflammation because that's thought to be very, very important in um, dry eye. And there's actually going to be a newer definition of dry eye um, coming out later this year by the International Dry Eye Workshop. Um, so the tear film is composed of three main layers. Um, the lipid layer, which I mentioned earlier, which is um, produced by the meibomian glands. You've got the water or aqueous layer that's produced by the main and accessory lac lacrimal glands. And then you've got the bottom mucin layer, um, which is produced by the goblet cells. And that mucin layer is responsible for sticking the tear film to the ocular surface. Um, and traditionally, um, there's two main types of dry eye aqueous deficient and evaporative, and it's still useful to think about dry eye in these two um, definitions. Even though it's a little bit outdated, it's still nice to kind of separate it into these two types. Um, so with aqueous deficient etiologies, um, you could have lacrimal gland insufficiency, and this can be primary or secondary. The most common causes of primary lacrimal gland insufficiency, insufficiency are going to be Sjogren syndrome um, and also age-related or postmenopausal. Um, secondary causes would be lacrimal gland infiltration, such as by lymphoma, sarcoid, or viral infection. You can get lacrimal duct obstruction, um, so scarring of the ductal orifices of the main and accessory lacrimal glands. You'll see this in chemical and thermal burns, uh, Stevens-Johnson syndrome, um, membranous conjunctivitis, and um, ocular cicatricial pemphigoid. And there's reflex hyposecretion, so this occurs when there's a problem or a blockage of the sensory nerves um, and that there's no feedback um, to the brain to kind of produce a basal amount of tears. So you'll see this with LASIK, you'll see it in contact lens where um, uh, HSV and zoster can also cause it as well as diabetes. So any sort of situation which could almost lead to like a neurotrophic um, keratitis um, causes a sensory block. You can ha also have a motor block to the lacrimal gland itself, and that, ca that is caused by cranial nerve 7 damage, which damages the secret of motor, motor fibers of the lacrimal gland and anticholinergic medications. Um, next, evaporative etiology. So the main one is going to be meibomian gland disease, which we talked about earlier. Um, mucin deficiency is kind of included under evaporative um, and you'll see this in chemical burns, Stevens-Johnson syndrome, and vitamin A deficiency. Um, also, any sort of situation that lead, can lead to an exposure um, keratopathy, um, such as lag ophthalmos, exophthalmos, uh, poor eyelid um, apposition can lead to increased evaporation. Also, if there's infrequent blinking, such as in Parkinson's or a sedated patient. Uh, topical drug preservative is another common cause of evaporative um, dry eye, and also contact lens wear. So you notice contact lens wear was present as an aqueous deficient um, etiology under a sensory block and also evaporative. So contact lens wear can kind of cause both um, components of dry eye, evaporative and aqueous deficient. Um, so as we know, dry eye um, does have many inflammatory mediators. There's increased HLA class 2 antigen expression in the conjunctival epithelium, increased CD4 T cell infiltration, also increased protease and MMP9 activity, which I'll talk about later on, um, and increased pro-inflammatory pro cytokine activity, um, such as TNF-alpha and interleukin-1 beta. And actually, it's a lot more complicated than this. Um, this is just a few of the inflammatory mediators. Um, it's been found that there's probably hundreds of mediators out there in dry eye. So as you know, these are all the dry eye symptoms. So they can feel dry, they can tear, people can feel like a burning sensation, foreign body sensation, itching, blurry vision. Um, the classic um, symptom is blurry vision that fluctuates or changes with blinking. So if patients kind of note that their vision fluctuates, it's gonna be dry eye. Typically it's worse later in the day because your eyes have been open all day. Um, worse when, it's out, when they're outside or if it's windy, and also worse when reading at the computer or watching TV because people blink less often when concentrating. 
Um, physical exam, so you want to look at the eyelids. We talked about blepharitis and meibomian gland dysfunction earlier. Look for um, any eyelid malposition. Um, look for something like entropion or ectropion, because that can cause tearing. Um, also look for trichiasis or dystichiasis, because that's another cause of tearing. Um, then you want to inspect the tear film. So as you look at patients, you'll, you'll get a sense of how, um, what's normal tear film and what's a high tear film, what's low tear film. So if you see low tear film, that's going to be dry eye, and you might see some mucus floating around in the tear film. That's also another indication for dry eye. A high tear film is actually epiphora. Um, so that's suggestive of dysfunctional tear drainage. So that's tearing, like actual over tearing and not reflux tearing from dry eye. Um, and we talked about tear breakup time earlier. Um, you want to look at the ocular surface to look at any conjunctival inflammation. Look for corneal filaments, which are indicative of very severe dry eye. Um, tarsal conjunctiva, uh, conjunctival scarring and some blepharot. I mean, you'll see this in really severe causes of dry eye, such as Stevens Johnson. Um, and there are various stains. Um, so fluorescein is by far the most common stain that you use. And so fluorescein stains basement membrane. Rose Bengal anglism and green um, stain divitalized cells. And you can see rose Bengal staining on the cornea here, and you can see lysamin green staining on the conjunctiva here. So the nice thing about um, rose Bengal and lysamin green is they're a little more sensitive. You can see more of it, especially on the conjunctiva as far as staining. Um, and lysamin green is used more often than rose Bengal because it's less irritating. Um, so even with anesthetic, people can still have stinging with rose Bengal. Um, Schirmer's testing is another traditional um, test for dry eye where basically filter paper strips are used to measure um, basal and sometimes reflex, reflex secretion over five minutes. Um, there's a modification of it where um, a topical anesthetic is used to measure basal secretion only. And so this is measured over a five minute period and then you check, you take out the filter paper strips and check and see how much of the tears have gone up the tear strip. And so less than five millimeter um, length of tears is moderate to severe dry eye, 5 to 10 is mild to moderate, and greater than 10 um, millimeters is normal. Um, there's another modification called Schirmer's 2, which actually you stick something up their nose to um, induce some reflex tearing. I don't know anyone who does that, but that's out there in the literature. Um, do the do, so the dry eye workshop has a um, dry eye severity grading scheme from 1 to 4, so basically um, level one dry eye is going to be your mild um, dry eye. So they may or, they may not have see you may not see any um, uh, signs clinically, and patients just have mild sy um, symptoms all the way up to grade four, which is severe, constant, debilitating symptoms with very marked um, clinical signs. Um, so that's kind of the whole spectrum of the disease. Um, there are a couple new point of service tests for dry eye. There's Tear Lab, which measures tear osmolarity, and Inflamadry, which measures MMP9. So, tear osmolarity refers to the concentrating of electrolytes in tears. Um, so, high, the higher the number, the more concentrated tears are. So, dry eye symptom, uh, dry eye disease is associated with um, elevated tear osmolarity. And elevated tear osmolarity is a contributing factor in cellular dam damage and upregulation of inflammation. And it correlates more closely to dry eye symptoms um, than some of the older um, dry eye tests. And it can also be diagnostic in the absence of symptoms. Um, so this may be important in someone um, who's about to have refractive or cataract surgery, which can increase dry eye. And so if they have an elevated tear osmolarity before surgery, and they may not have symptoms, you might want to tell them, look, you may, have, you may be more prone to have some dry eye symptoms after surgery. Um, tear lab, so the tear lab, what, do, what it does is that you have to sample the tear film, um, and it takes about 20 seconds to do that, and so you just take the tip to the um, lateral canthal area to take the, measure the tears. And dry eye is diagnosed if there's elevated osmolarity, um, greater than 308, um, or if there's variability between the eyes of greater than 8, or if there's variability on repeat measurements, then that's diagnostic of dry eye. And this test has a sensitivity of 88% and specificity of 75%. Um, and this is a scale um, that's used, so anything that's above about 300 or 305 is mild dry eye, and the higher the number, the more severe um, the dry eye. Um, so next I'll talk about um, MMP9, which stands for, uh, for matrix metalloproteinase 9. So this is an inflammatory marker, and it's elevated in the presence of elevated tear osmolarity. 
And so higher levels of MMP9 in the tears actually correlate with moderate to severe symptoms on that report of the International Dry Eye Workshop. Um, but it's a little bit nonspecific because MMP9 is also elevated in allergy and it's elevated in infection. So it's not that specific. Um, but in the right clinical setting, it's very useful. So um, there is an MMP9 test um, called inflammadry, and it was shown in the FDA study that this test had 85% sensitivity and 94% specificity. And it's similar to the AdenoPlus test, which detects adenovirus, which is similar to a pregnancy test. So it looks exactly like that. Um, it takes 10 minutes to, result, uh, to process the result. And the brighter, there's basically two kind of stripes that you look at. So the brighter the red positive stripe, the more MMP9 is present. So this is what it looks like. So you kind of assemble the kit and you touch the inferior um, tarsal conjunctiva to collect um, tears. Um, then you run the test, and after 10 minutes, you'll be able to read the results. So if you see a pink positive stripe, it means it's positive. Um, and the more bright that pink stripe is, um, the more MMP9 there is. So it's kind of nice that if you just have like a tiny little bit of red, technically positive, but you know that maybe there's not as much MMP9, whereas if it's like really bright and positive, then you know that there's a lot. Um, there are some limitations to the tear lab and inflammatory tests. Um, it must, they must be done prior to exam, prior to any drops. Um, so there has to be some indication, maybe based on symptoms, um, to do the test. Um, and the patient actually can't put in any drops within two hours prior to testing because that can interfere with the result. Um, so these tests are helpful for diagnosing dry eye in earlier stages. So kind of mentioned earlier, um, it's good for people who may not have symptoms, but it's also helpful for patients with symptoms, um, but they may not have slit lamp findings. And this is a nice test to kind of show that they actually do have dry eye. Um, we talked about um, dry eye prior to cataract surgery and, and refractive surgery. So it's actually important to treat any dry eye present because that can affect preoperative measurements um, and it's important for pre- and post-operative treatment. Um, if you have positivity on this test, you might think about starting some anti-inflammatory therapy sooner and I'll talk about what those therapies are. Um, it can give the provider and the patient objective data and it can be used to gauge the efficacy of treatment. So you could have a positive test and then give them treatment later on, repeat the testing and see if anything is better. Um, so I'm going to start with kind of basic non-prescription dry eye treatments and we'll kind of work our way up. So some basic things that are cheap um, include just taking frequent breaks while reading at the computer, um, drinking more water. People ask about that. I think it's only helpful if someone's dehydrated um, for it to work for dry eye. Um, there's only a li limit to how much water you can drink. Um, limiting contact lens wear or changing to a high DK in contact lenses can be helpful for dry eye. Increasing humidity in some way, shape, or form. So that could be limiting heaters, fans, or um, AC, adding a humidifier, um, using moisture chamber, chamber goggles, which you can wear, kind of these are, are helpful to wear at night. And then there's actually moisture chamber goggles, which more kind of look more stylish, like sporty sunglasses that have like a little rim around the edge that kind of, kind of sucks onto around the eye. Um, that acts as a moisture chamber. Um, moving to a humid environment, um, because we live in such a dry climate, um, is also helpful. Um, tear supplementation, um, I don't recommend any vasoconstrictors, nothing that says it's good to get the red out or good for dry eye. Um, increased viscosity um, coats the cornea better, so any, the thicker um, drops can coat the cornea better, but the downside is that they cause blur. Um, if patients are saying like they have a lot of irritation when they first wake up in the morning, they might have, they might have um, nighttime lag ophthalmos, so then I would recommend a lubricating gel ointment at bedtime. And if patients are using um, their bottle tears more than four or five times a day, I'd tell them to switch to preservative free um, because the bottle drops have preservative in it, which um, can actually irritate the eyes a lot more if they use it a ton, so um, I tell them to switch to preservative free if they're using them a lot. Um, okay, so next I'm going to talk about omega-3 fatty acids. So um, they are necessary for the lacrimal gland to make tears, and they can also decrease systemic inflammatory activity, um, uh, decreasing interleukin-1 and TNF-alpha. So there's two, I guess, main classes of um, omega-3 fatty acids. There's fish oil, 
which um, is comprised of um, EPA and DHA, which are kind of listed up there. And there's also flaxseed oil, which is alpha linoleic acid. And there was a study done several years ago, um, the Women's Health Study, which kind of first showed that omega-3s may be helpful for dry eye. So this was looking at a whole lot of other systemic diseases. So this was not looking at eyes at all, but looking at, they looked at almost 40,000 female health professionals, uh, most of them age 45 to 84, and they completed a dietary questionnaire. Um, they also have some self-reports of clinically diagnosed dry eye cases. And when they adjusted for demographics, whether or not they were on hormone therapy and total fat intake, they found that those who had a higher ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 fatty acid intake actually had a higher incidence of dry eye syndrome. And tuna consumption was inversely related to dry eye symptom, uh, dry eye uh, disease. So there really wasn't any much done as far as um, studies kind of proving that omega-3s were helpful for dry until just recently in this month's cornea um, journal. So this was a study which was a multi-center perspective, double-masked, randomized trial, which looked at placebo versus fish oil. And the, um, the amount they used was kind of listed up there. They've got 1680 milligrams of EPA and 560 milligrams of DHA. So that comes out to be almost 2200 milligrams of fish oil daily, um, and this was the, the brand that they used, Physician Recommended Nutraceuticals, and they found that by 12 weeks there was a statistical, statistically significant improvement in tear osmolarity, uh, tear breakup time was statistically increased, there was a reduction in MMP9 positivity, and um, there, were, there was improvement in OSDI scores. So OSDI is a dry eye questionnaire um, which has 12 questions, and they found that there's an improvement in scores, so symptoms, um, based on fish oil treatment. So this is actually a nice kind of scientific way to prove that fish oil does work. Um, so about two to three grams a day of um, omega-3 is recommended. Um, for fish oil, there's a couple different formulations, ethyl ester and triglyceride formulations. Ethyl ester is what's used most commonly. It's kind of used for, makes it easier to process the fish oil in factories whereas the triglyceride is a more natural um, form. And um, it's thought that maybe the triglyceride form may be um, a little easier, uh, better absorbed by the body. Um, so fish oil comes in usually capsules. And you can also buy flaxseed oil capsules. However, it's not as effective as fish oil. There's kind of been other studies which have shown that flaxseed oil is, I mean, yes, it's helpful, but you need to take like four times at the amount as you would in fish oil to have the same result. Um, so. Because of that reason, I don't really recommend flaxseed oil. I mean, if someone's already taking it, I, I see that's fine, but um, I usually don't recommend it just because it doesn't work quite as well. But if you have someone who's a strict vegetarian, then flaxseed oil is fine. Um, you can buy flaxseed oil capsules, or you could buy like whole bottles, which you can find in like Whole Foods, um, just bottles of flaxseed oil. Um, it's important if they're using the bottles that, they, that you don't cook it because heat can actually um, cause it to not work anymore as far as um, uh, effectiveness. Um, oil has about 2.5 grams per teaspoon. Um, people on really strict diets do have to know that there's just a few extra calories. There's like 10 extra calories per gram of fish or flaxseed oil. Um, okay, so that's all about omega-3s. Next I'm going to talk about um, prescription anti-inflammatory therapy. Um, so Topical cyclosporin 0.05% orostasis is an anti-inflammatory topical treatment used twice a day, and this prevents T cell activation. Um, so the vehicle, so the non-active component to the fish or to the um, orostasis, is a castor oil and glycerin-based emulsion, which decreases um, evaporative tear loss with a minimal blur, and it's also designed to make the cyclosporin more soluble. Um, it does take a while for the topical cyclosporin to actually work, um, at least three months. So um, I will sometimes consider the use, concomitant use of uh, topical steroids uh, for six weeks while the restasis is working. And the topical steroids um, can maybe eliminate the sting that some people get with restasis. Um, it's really not effective against blepharitis, but it's actually helpful in people who have um, allergies as well um, because there's an anti-inflammatory component which can help calm down allergies. Um, like I said, it takes at least three months to become effective. Um, and then when people start, you know, Googling, they, they Google cyclosporin and they may be alarmed by what they find because, you know, as you know, it's a chemotherapy agent. 
Um, so there was a study which looked at Restasis um, instilled BID for 12 months in dry eye patients, and then they checked um, their blood, and they did not find any, um, no cyclosporin was actually detectable within less than 0.1 nanograms per ml. Um, and they took samples at different times of the day, and they didn't, they couldn't find the cyclosporin. So that's good. Now you can reassure patients that it's not um, transmitted, or it's not, um, yeah, transmitted systemically. And there's actually been no systemic side effects from restasis. Um, just about a couple months ago, there's a new um, competitor to restasis called Lefitograst or Zydra, and this. Um, blocks the binding of lymphocyte function associated antigen 1 or LFA1 to interleukin adhesion, um, oh, put that wrong, <laughs> um, ICAM1 basically. Um, so, and T cell activation is also um, influenced by this binding. And lofitograst was shown to significantly improve inferior corneal staining from baseline to three months. Um, and then um, they also found that it significantly improves eye, the eye dryness score, so meaning um, patient reported symptoms after three months. Um, but then this, they had kind of did a subsequent study which showed that the corneal staining did not improve in this subsequent study. Um, the most common side effects were stinging, blurred vision, um, change in taste, um, and there's also no systemic toxicity seen. So my personal experience with both of these medications, I have no financial interest in either of the companies that make it, so I actually take Restasis. And um, the nice thing about the Restasis is that, so both of these are packaged um, in preservative-free vials. Um, and the Restasis has like a lot of drops in each vial. So um, I actually tell patients that it's okay to, to reuse the vial over one use. Um, and you can actually use it technically over um, a 24-hour period, which is three doses. And so if they're buying like 60 vials, which is technically um, a one-month supply because you use it BID, um, they can make that one month supply last three months if they reuse the vial. And so the, the company knows that this pretty much everyone tells, um, all, all, all physicians tell patients this. Um, and so they kind of, they know it's not like part of their technical like instructions, but they say it's okay to do that. Um, in practice, there's about eight drops, so you could use it for four doses. Um, so Restasis for me took literally four months to become effective, but since then it's been really effective. And there's some low-grade stinging that lasted a few minutes initially, but that resolved um, or got better over time. And so I'll tell patients this, that they, this is possible. It's going to take a while. It might sting. For most people, it's tolerable. It'll get better. Um, Zydra, the jury is still out because it just came out as far as how effective it is. Um, but the downside to Zydra is you can literally only get two, maybe about two and a half drops out of each vial. So it's literally each vial is for one-time use. So a one-month supply of Zydra is only going to last one month. Um, which may be financially like three times as expensive as, as Restasis, potentially. Um, so the stinging, so I tried it for a few days. So the stinging varied from like the first time I put it in, it was like a lot of stinging, um, and then sometimes it was less, and then the next time it would be more, so I wasn't really sure why. Um, but the stinging didn't last very long, it was like 30 seconds. Um, but then I did have that discusia or that um, kind of strange taste in the mouth. And for me, it lasted like 30 to 60 minutes, which was a long time to have a really nasty, bitter taste in your mouth. Um, so, I mean, I didn't use it long enough to know if it was effective, but um, these are just kind of some things I'll be telling patients about um, Zydra. Okay, so next I'll talk about punctal occlusion. And the most common methods are with collagen, um, which is dissolvable, seen at the bottom, and silicone, which is seen at the top. Um, there are kind of um, punctal plug called smart plugs, which are, they actually sit um, within the cannuliculus. So you put them in and then you can't tell if they're in or not. And the problem is that they don't dissolve. Um, so there's been several um, studies, or not studies, case reports, which have, um, where the smart plugs kind of got infected or if there was a problem and they needed to be taken out. And so you have to like consult oculoplastics to get in there to like remove these things. So I don't recommend the smart plugs. Um, I don't think we have them here, so I don't think you have to worry about that. Um, I usually occlude the lower puncta first because about 60% of the um, tear outflow will go through the lower puncta. Um, and if you still need, if the patients still need more um, occlusion, then you might consider the upper puncta. Could consider punctal cautery, um, which is a more permanent solution, but I always try plugs first. Um, and I'll, I'll 
recommend punctal cautery if the plugs aren't staying in and if the patients think that they had um, uh, improvement in their symptoms while the plugs were in. Um, and punctal occlusion has be better results after starting anti-inflammatory treatment because if you, the thought is if you put plugs in before starting any anti-inflammatory treatment, all those pro-inflammatory mediators are now just gonna sit on the octave surface longer because of the plugs. So if you start anti-inflammatory treatment first and then go to plugs, I think that's a more logical um, way to go about things. Um, next, I'll talk about floppy eyelid syndrome. Um, so you'll see this as extensive um, lid laxity, and it's more than just the lid laxity that you'll see in really elderly patients, because this is a this is a situation where just pulling up their eyelid, their upper eyelid, completely averts that. So you can't do that in normal people. So if you you do that and their lid averts, and you can like look into their upper fornix, like they've got floppy eyelid syndrome. Um, symptoms will be the symptoms of dry eye, so eye irritation, redness, and discharge. Um, it responds poorly to lubrication and topical steroids, and it's a, a bit tough to treat. Um, but there's a high association with obstructive sleep apnea, so I tell patients who I see floppy eyelid syndrome, I will ask them if they have sleep apnea, or if they don't know they have sleep apnea, you know, do they snore? And pretty much almost always they'll say like, oh yeah, I wear a CPAP to bed, or I don't know what sleep apnea does, and their wife says, oh yeah, you snore all the time. And it's like, okay, you know, you got to see your primary care doctor, um, get a sleep study, because um, there's a high association of obstructive sleep apnea with major cardiovascular events, like heart attack and stroke. So I think you could potentially save someone's life by just telling them they have floppy eyelid syndrome or diagnosing it. Um, floppy eyelid syndrome is um, also associated with keratoconus and Down syndrome. Um, even though it responds top, um, poorly to lubrication, it's kind of the really the only treatment you can do, um, you know, nighttime ointment, um, as much using as much topical lubrication as possible. Um, you could consider horizontal eyelid shortening for this as well. Um, next is uh, superior limbic keratoconjunctivitis or SLK. Um, the signs of this are going to be inflammation and staining of the upper tarsal and bulbar conjunctiva. Um, so it's kind of the opposite to dry eye. Usually dry eye, you'll see inferior corneal staining. Um, in SLK, you'll see everything superior, superiorly, and you might see some filaments at the superior limbus and superior cornea. Um, it's thought that the etiology of this could be possibly from excess superior conjunctiva, um, kind of laxity leading to friction on the superior ocular surface. Um, but the symptoms will kind of be nonspecific. It's going to sound like dry eye. They'll have foreign body sensation, burning sensation, um, itching, and dryness. And there can be an association of SLK with thyroid disease, so you want to check thyroid function tests. Um, you could consider testing for autoimmune disease as well. Um, the treatment initially is going to be with aggressive topical lubrication, um, punctal plugs, topical steroid, or cyclosporin, or other anti-inflammatory treatments. Um, a bandage contact lens can be helpful. Um, people have used topical silver nitrate to kind of apply to the um, superior conjunctiva to try and decrease some of that um, friction. Um, and another kind of more drastic method that works is recessing um, the superior conjunctiva or resecting it or applying cautery to the superior conjunctiva. Um, next is recurrent corneal erosion, um, which um, will present with severe pain upon awakening or severe pain when they kind of wake up in the middle of the night. And predisposing factors for this will be epithelial basement membrane dystrophy or MAP dot fingerprint dystrophy, which is shown at the bottom there, um, or prior traumatic corneal abrasion. So the treatment, again, is with aggressive lubrication, plugs, topical steroid, or, or restasis. Um, bandage contact lenses can also be helpful. Um, you could recommend hypertonic saline or Miro 128 once the epi defect has healed because the, what that does is it tries to tack the epithelium down um, so it doesn't slough off. Um, but if that doesn't work, then they need, you're, they're looking at some sort of um, procedure. So um, epithelial debridement or superficial keratectomy is the other name for it. Basically kind of scraping off that abnormal epithelium um, and then putting in a bandage contact lens and hope that the epithelium that heals over, heals over more smoothly. Um, during the procedure, you could also consider doing some diamond burr polishing to kind of polish down um, Bowman's membrane, or you could do anterior stomal micropuncture, um, which is basically taking a needle and kind of making little 
uh, little dock marks into Bowman's that act as little kind of irregular areas for the epithelium to kind of stick into once the epithelium is kind of healing over. Um, you can't do anterior stromal micropuncture over the visual axis, however, because it causes little scars, so you don't want that in the visual axis. Um, PTK, or uh, phototherapeutic keratectomy, is another possible treatment for it. So this is basically, it's basically like PRK, um, so refractive surgery, but you're not doing it to achieve a particular refractive result. You're applying the laser just to kind of uh, take off epithelium and kind of roughen up the Bowman's layer. Um, topical anesthetic abuse is a commonly overlooked um, and misdiagnosed um, uh, entity. And this leads to a neurotrophic keratitis because um, they can't feel anything. When they can't feel anything, you know, their epithelial defects are not going to close and they're going to have chronic inflammation and they may have a sterile ulcer. Um, so topical anesthetic abuse is in the differential diagnosis of a chronic, any chronic keratitis that doesn't go away. So the signs include a persistent epithelial defect. They may have a ton of inflammation like a corneal ulcer or a hypopion. They could have a ring infiltrate. And the corneal thinning can actually lead to perforation. And it's going to be difficult to elucidate this in the history because patients usually aren't going to be very forthcoming about saying they've been using this drop all the time. Um, but risk factors include care on the emergency room, um, either or you know they, they may have stolen a bottle of um, the topical anesthetic. So if you're on call, kind of or you, just anywhere where you're examining a patient, you want to keep track of your bottles of tetracaine and propericaine because you don't want patients to just walk off with it because you put that magic drop in and they're like, ooh, I want to have that at home. They may just take your bottle. Um, some emergency room doctors even now are kind of giving them bottles of, um, of propericaine, which is really bad. Um, if the patient's in the healthcare field and has ready, ready access to topical um, anesthetics or if they have a close family member who can like get the stuff for them, those are risk factors. So it's, it's really hard to, um, to figure it out, but with anyone who just isn't healing with the normal treatments, you want to suspect um, anesthetic abuse. Um, and this is what it can look like. You could have like a small infiltrate, you could have like a really big infil uh, ring infiltrate with tons of inflammation. Um, you could have kind of a, a gray-white looking kind of ulcer there. So it doesn't have any sort of classic appearance. Um, okay, so next I'll talk about corneal delin. So corneal delin is a saucer-like excavation of the peripheral cornea near the limbus, and it's associated with some sort of um, adjacent elevated thing. So this could be a conjunctival growth, a limbal growth, it could be chemosis, chronic chemosis, it could be a bleb. Um, so what happens is that the cornea that's adjacent to this elevated thing just doesn't get um, proper, uh, the tears don't really flow across that area because the tears are kind of flowing on the top of whatever is elevated, so it may be a big bleb, and it doesn't get down into the cornea, this little um, area of cornea right next to it. And so any area of the cornea that doesn't get proper moisture is going to thin. Um, okay, so that's what I just talked about. So here are some pictures of Dellen's. So, on the left is a delon that's actually associated with an elevated or edematous um, graft host junction. So that graft host junction is very elevated, that adjacent area of the cornea is not getting um, tear uh, film coverage and so it starts to thin. Um, on the right is a delon from conjunctival swelling surrounding a sclera buckle. So it's really elevated and that cornea is just not getting enough moisture. Um, so the treatment is going to be very aggressive, lubrication or ointment you could consider a tarsorophy, and it's, if it's possible at all to remove or solve the problem with whatever is elevating the conjunctiva next to the cornea, um, that should be done. Um, next is limbal stem cell deficiency. So um, corneal stem cells are located around the limbus, and they're responsible for renewing the ocular surface with new epithelial cells. And the limbus also acts as a barrier against corneal neovascularization from the invasion of conjunctival cells. And about 25 to 33 percent of stem cells are needed for normal resurfacing of the cornea. So if you have limbal stem cells at, um, absent, this could be from a few different reasons, or this can result in a few different things. Um, it can, um, you can lose your ability to have effective wound healing, will start to get super, um, superficial corneal neovascularization, and you can have an irregular corneal surface from abnormal corneal epithelium. So this is what 
limbal stem cell deficiency looks like. Um, on the left is stem cell deficiency from mitomycin that was used um, during a TRAB, and you'll see just this, you know, you don't really see any vessels here, but you notice that there's a lot of um, kind of abnormal whorls of epi uh, abnormal epithelium. Um, on the right is severe limbal stem cell deficiency, so you got vessels kind of coming um, from the conjunctiva over the ocular, uh, over the cornea into the visual axis. Um, and this is from corneal uh, neovascularization and epithelial dysplasia from just chronic soft contact lens wear. So um, people sleeping in their lenses all the time or even people just abu totally abusing their contact lenses, um, you can have limbal stem cell deficiency. Um, so there's several causes of limbal stem cell deficiency. Um, primary include aniridia um, or PEC6 gene mutations. Um, a condition called sclerocornea, and there's another condition called keratitis ichthyosis deafness or KID syndrome. Um, so th these are more rare causes, but the secondary causes of limbal stem cell deficiency are going to be a lot more common. So this will include um, thermal chemical burns that will damage uh, the limbal stem cells. Um, I talked about contact lens wear. Um, radiation to the eye can damage um, limbal stem cells. Eye surgery, so if you have enough damage to the bull stem cells all around the cornea um, that can lead to a stem cell deficiency. Um, mucous membrane pemphigoid and Stevens Johnson syndrome can lead to scarring and damage of the stem cells. Um, a pterygium is actually a very localized limbal stem cell deficiency. So it means that right in that area where the pterygium is and when it's growing onto the cornea, there are, there's a loss of limbal stem cells right there. Um, to topical medications such as pilocarpine, antimetabolites, Antibiotics and beta blockers can lead to a limbal stem cell deficiency. Um, so the treatment, so if it's mild um, and due to local factors such as contact lenses or drops, um, you can try and discontinue them. Um, you could consider debriding abnormal epithelium, um, but this is only going to work if there's enough normal limbal stem, cell, um, stem cells to repopulate the whole surface. Um, you could consider a scleral contact lens because that actually doesn't touch the cornea or the limbus. Um, surgically, if it's um, if you've got a pterygium, you just take out the pterygium and you could use a conjunctival autograft. Um, if you have someone who has a unilateral chemical or thermal burn, you could um, actually do a limbal autograft from the patient's fellow eye. So you harvest um, a section of limbal stem cells from the fellow eye, so the normal eye, and put that on the um, on the burned eye. Um, if there is bilateral disease, um, you can do a limbal allograft from um, an HLA matched living donor or eye bank eye um, and do need uh, systemic immunosuppression for this. Or you could do a keratoprosthesis, which is um, an artificial cornea. I think that's my last slide. Yeah. So, any questions on anything I talked about here? Thanks for coming.